The South African business environment is currently hostile towards particularly small businesses. What can ordinary business people do to state-proof their businesses? Well, joining me to discuss is Pete LaRue of the business group Sakulicha. He's the CEO there. Pete, welcome to Solutions with David and Sarah. Thanks for the invitation, David. I'm looking forward to this discussion. So Pete, let's first of all start off with an overview of where the South African business environment is at. What are firms facing in the business environment today? What are the market conditions? And also in terms of state regulation, what are the kinds of rules and policies that they're having to navigate? David, we're in, an, in a hostile policy environment in South Africa, and we've been in this for a number of years now. We've had a change from one administration to another, and in some respects, uh, you, know, you could say there were, there were improvements, but the problem is that the underlying uh, philosophy and ideas in the ruling party in South Africa is not conducive to doing business. And uh, it's uh, given the ideology, given the policy commitments at the party level, we're going to see a continued uh, policy making that is uh, harmful to a flourishing society and makes it more difficult to do business. Uh, we see this in uh, you know, talks about expropriation without compensation. We see this in black economic empowerment legislation. We see this in the hesitancy uh, to uh, privatize energy to, uh, uh, generation. We see this in uh, just a, a range of collapses at different levels of government and where it's uh, not collapsing harmful interventions. Now, of course, this isn't unique. There are many countries in the world with problems. Uh, the country has severe fiscal and uh, problems, uh, but to monetary policy speaking, it's uh, rather stable. And so there are some, uh, some points of light, but overall, it's a tough uh, a, uh, place to do business. And like I recently said to some uh, international friends who asked me about South Africa, I said, I have to be honest, South Africa is not a good place to invest in. Uh, but South African companies can be and still are because you never invest in a country. You always invest in specific opportunities and specific people and in specific uh, companies. So I can recommend South African companies, but it's not a country to recommend for business. So Pete, given what we know about this environment, how can we go about protecting our organizations, our capital from state intervention and state hostility? How do we state proof ourselves? David, uh, one of the uh, old adages about uh, government or the state is that its uh, responsibility, uh, one of its primary responsibilities is to provide a good environment for doing business. And we've sort of accepted that um, and it became common knowledge, but I think we should challenge ourselves and ask, is that really so? And uh, I think uh, th actually the correct answer is that a good environment for business is in the first place, the responsibility of business. We want to do business, um, so we must make sure that the environment for doing business is conducive, and uh, that is our social responsibility. Um, if, if we have, and we have, and that is our primary one, it is to make sure that the environment for doing business is good, because in that environment we can generate wealth, and we can uh, we, th that is necessary for a flourishing society. So um, with that. Uh, internal locus of control, uh, mind shift, I think that uh, in a hostile policy environment, whether it's South Africa or anywhere else in the world, um, we can say that maybe businesses uh, should uh, think of state proofing their business operations. Why? Because generating wealth is in the interest of society. It's, of course, in your own interest as to make money and generate wealth, but that is always a, a mutually beneficial and societally beneficial um, activity. So, uh, David, the idea of state proofing your business um, is to internalize the locus of control, saying, I'm here to do business. I'll reform the external environment if I can. Uh, if I cannot, then I'm going to protect, uh, make sure that my business and my activities are protected and I can generate wealth and uh, against harmful interventions and uh, where something that should be there isn't provided in terms of infrastructure or uh, other forms of institutional infrastructure, well, then maybe we can pool our capital and provide that ourselves. Pete, many business owners might be watching this podcast or listening to it and, and thinking, well, what kinds of strategies must I be pursuing? Uh, they recognize the difficulty of operating in South Africa, but are unsure how to proceed. Could you outline some strategies for how you can go about uh, implementing some of these principles uh, in your organization? 
Yeah, uh, David, I think um, I'll, I'll break it down in, in terms of a, a two-step strategy. Uh, for the first is, of course, that as a business, you, you can do things to be more state-proof. You could do things to mitigate against the harmful interventions or uh, lower your cost of doing business. And I'll highlight some of those. And that's, uh, that's an entrepreneurial decision that some uh, companies are going to be able to do better than others. Some business people have more, uh, more acutely able to do so. so. And so uh, we, we'll highlight some of the ways that can be done, but it's always uh, going to end up being an individual entrepreneurial decision um, that cannot be prescribed without access to the relevant facts and circumstances and time and so on. It's an entrepreneurial decision. But there's a, a second kind of entrepreneurial um, uh, intervention we can undertake in, in terms of state proofing that is working at the institutional level uh, and that is working together as businesses to change the environment in which we do business and so um, I think in our discussion forward I, I could highlight these two different kinds of state proofing the one is state proofing your business individually through your own entrepreneurial decisions but then the other one is um, investing in a network uh, that can change uh, the environment in which you do business so that you don't have to take all these additional factors into account. All right, Pete, so we have these two strategies. What about on the entrepreneurial level? Let's start with that and then we can move to the institutional level. All right, so at the entrepreneurial level, I'm going to highlight, let's say at least four ways in which you can state-proof uh, your, your business. The first is to diversify your jurisdictional exposure. Uh, if you're a business doing a business in South Africa um, and all your IP or assets are in South Africa and all your, um, uh, all, all your legal exposure will be uh, uh, adjudicated in South Africa, then you are very much linked to the, the success of this administration and this state. But if you set up your company or you uh, do a, a agreements with companies in other jurisdictions, then you have additional measures of uh, limiting or uh, additional remedies that you can pursue in the event of a harmful intervention with regard to your property rights or contracts in South Africa. Um, there, for example, you can look for, and there still are some uh, international bilateral trade agreements. You can uh, look at those and see which countries provide you with better guarantees in terms of um, uh, of uh, property rights protection uh, if you operate from those companies from those countries into South Africa so that's that's one way of diversifying your or state proofing yourself it's by uh, increasing your exposure to different states um, not only the South Africa one all states have their problems but if you're not exposed to one and one alone then you can arbitrage the jurisdictional cost so, Pete, how do we uh, go about identifying other jurisdictions and dealing with the uh, cross-jurisdictional issues, cross-border uh, financial issues, for example, taxation? Uh, are those insurmountable problems? Well, in business, very few problems are insurmountable. All, all amount to an additional cost, and you have to factor that in. I think what we're arguing is that in South Africa, the, the cost of exposing yourself only to this uh, jurisdiction is becoming significant. And so uh, it's probably being going to be cheaper to expose yourself in the long run to other jurisdictions. Some of them, uh, you ask about how we can identify them. Some of them have identified themselves over many, many centuries even. You can think of Switzerland um, and others, but you can also try and be creative and possibly pursue um, operations from companies with, uh, let's say, not in the uh, developed world or not in the, in the West or in Europe, with which South Africa seeks, uh, those countries with which South Africa seeks uh, a diplomatic, a fav favorable diplomatic relationships nowadays, maybe Brazil, or Russia. I'm just speculating here, yeah? it depends on the area, you know, the kind of business you do, but maybe that also offers you additional protection um, if, uh, because the South African government would not want to be uh, in, in problems with those governments, maybe diplomatically. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm arguing this in the abstract, always the concrete answer will depend on the nature of your business, the scope of your business, um, uh, and some other networks you have available. Of course. So what about income stream diversification? So when you're looking at the sources of income for your business, how can you go about diversifying those income streams? 
I recently spoke to a member of Sartalicha in the design and branding segment. And uh, you know, three years ago, all their business was from within South Africa. Um, and uh, one of the byproducts or opportunities they seized during the COVID-19 situation, and even slightly before that, was to explore developing a clientele in uh, the uh, in, in the uh, Scandinavian countries. And today, almost half their business comes from those countries. They were uh, they they didn't market there. They identified one or two clients, and then from there on, it was word of mouth. And so, by doing good business, remember South Africa has, um, in in many respects, a low cost of production. Uh, it can be in some high skilled labor areas or for other reasons, you can produce in South Africa things at a lower cost than you would want to produce them locally in say Scandinavia. So, but, but by diversifying the, the clientele, the income streams you have from to clientele outside of South Africa, that enables you to stay in South Africa, do business, have, an high, have a high standard of living um, and pay good dividends in South Africa, but not serving only clients in South Africa. And you're hedged to uh, harmful uh, interventions that, ne that negatively influence your local clients. Um, you're only halfway exposed now in, in that company's case. All right. And Pete, are there any other strategies for income diversification besides going offshore? Uh, what about in the domestic market, trying to diversify your services or products that you offer to the market? I think we can add the, uh, the, the state as a client here. Um, it normally is very safe to do business with governments. It takes maybe a while and you have to develop another kind of network to sustain that. And it comes, it's a little bit dirty sometimes, very often it's, it's a murky business doing business with states. Uh, but in South Africa, doing business with the state comes with additional problems. And so I think the cost of doing business with the state increases. It increases through policies such as black economic empowerment. We see in the procurement regulation space in South Africa, uh, regulations that require you to um, even sometimes basically uh, sell 50 to 100% of your company to black shareholders. Um, otherwise, you will not be able to do contracts with the government. I hate to put it in these terms, but these are the terms put in the, in the, in the uh, mm. tender documents by, for example, ESCOM or other state utilities. Um, and so doing business with the state, um, uh, that's one of your income streams. If it traditionally was, um, you'll have to reconsider the cost of that income stream. And you would have to reconsider the, um, I think, if you're thinking about going into business with the state, of course, then um, that's, that's the, the additional cost to that. And you, uh, in a country where their fiscal problems is increasing, so in South Africa, you have a the deteriorating fiscal situation, even, even rapidly so, and it's not clear that it's going to increase. In fact, everything points to a deterioration, further deterioration. You are at some point going to run into delays in payments. You already have delays in payments in South Africa. That's mostly administratively, not because there isn't money, um, but, uh, but in, a, uh, in future, that, that's also a risk. So um, the, you can state-proof yourself, uh, more by being more hesitant about doing business with the state. Yeah, and also given procurement irregularities, often the playing field is not even, notwithstanding some of the uh, BE regulations, for example, uh, that could just be going to politically connected cronies and uh, you could spend a lot of time and effort and money uh, on a procurement contract, which you have no hope in winning in the first place. I, I was recently in... Uh in another country, uh, in a European country. And uh, we had discussions there with many business people uh, trying to establish some, um, uh, it was a fact-finding mission. And of course it's mutual. So we also explained to them the context in South Africa. And it was very hard to explain uh, the concept of BEE. It was very hard to explain um, that the race of the owner can mean something in whether you win a contract or not, whether you deliver a service, whether you get a license or not. Uh, because, uh, I mean, internationally, it, the first thing that should count is uh, whether the service actually does something for the consumer, for the public. That's the overriding factor. But in South Africa, that's secondary and even third to things like BEE and other procurement legislation. So these kinds of things are tough to explain. And if they're so tough to explain, maybe it's because they don't make sense. And maybe then it's better not to expose yourself to the, that regulatory environment. It's a, it's a game that uh, you can't win because the rules of that game is going to keep changing.
I once met an individual from Malaysia, a senior business person. He was telling me uh, about uh, some of the sh shortcomings of their own affirmative action policies, uh, that it was being abused by politically connected elites. And uh, we had a, a wry chuckle about some of the similarities between our two countries. Pete, we've spoken about the regulatory environment, uh, the market conditions as well, but in what other ways are businesses having to be confronted by hostile state actions? Well, you, uh, we have members ranging from very small to very large. Um, and one thing that we found is that they don't like to be exposed. They don't like to be publicly associated with difficult topics. That makes sense because business, the business of business is, is doing business, uh, providing the, the core activity, uh, the goods and services related to that core activity. And just as it's, it's important for businesses not to uh, fizzle out into all kinds of unrelated business operations, um, businesses are not uh, by nature good at developing the institutions around uh, a business within which they should operate. It's very mm -hmm. important and it's always part of the discussion, but businesses would like to focus on providing goods and services, not on developing the institutional context around them. Now, um, sometimes uh, we, we may be critical about big business in South Africa, and I certainly have, and um, it, people are critical from time to time and saying, well, big business should be more forceful. Um, and yes, I'd welcome that, and there's a place for that. But being on the radar is hazardous. Uh, in a hostile policy environment, if you're on the radar, um, then that policy is going to affect you proportionally in more severe ways than it otherwise would. So one way of state proofing yourself is flying either under the radar or above the radar. What I mean by that is if you're small enough where you can break your business operations up into small enough units um, and you can set up arrangements between them as is often the case with BE or trying to um, you know, mitigate the effects of employment legislation, et cetera. Then you, you're small enough to be under the radar. Nobody notices you. You have a good relationship with your key uh, clients um, and, uh, and, and, and everybody realizes that it's a beneficial equilibrium. Uh, we're not gonna cause trouble for each other. Um, uh, even in small companies, uh, uh, employees can often also understand that um, sure on paper, we can arrange something else and we can lay claim to more uh, benefits or something. But if we try and do that, the company is not gonna perform as well and in the long run will be worse off. So that's why flying under the radar is a state proofing strategy. Another one is flying above the radar. And that is if you can develop and provide a service or a product that is so crucial um, and so, um, so, uh, so, so desirable that uh, it's, uh, it's politically impossible for government to attack it uh, or uh, it's simply, uh, you're simply a multinational maybe in some luxury goods brand uh, and you have uh, maybe uh, so many exposures to other jurisdictions that if the uh, local state environment or the local government uh, regulations uh, are too problematic for you, everybody knows you can just move on. So you're above the radar. The, the, the area where you're not state proof is if you're on the radar, if you're so uh, big or so vocal um, that, you, um, that you, you feature prominently uh, in, the, uh, in the news or in the public mind, and then a, a government can more easily see whether you comply in spirit and in the letter of their prescriptions. And remember, often um, not only policy is harmful, uh, not only legislation is harmful, but also government policy. And so even while you may completely be in line with legislation, often uh, regulators and policymakers would require you to uh, overtly uh, be in step with their agenda. And if you are questioning that agenda, even if you're uh, completely in line with legislation, just questioning the agenda can make it more difficult to get a license, can make it more uh, risky to uh, be more exposed to uh, prosecution for, let's say, competition policy or anything like that. So David, um, being under the radar is good, being above the radar is good, being on the radar is difficult. And I have some sympathy for companies who who don't want to expose themselves too much at, at that level and, and pay lip service sometimes. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not nice, but, but I understand how that happens. 
Yeah, I think that goes also for some of the organized business lobby groups uh, that tend to want to play nice with government. They value having a seat at the table, um, but then often that ends up legitimizing the hegemony of the, the existing policy framework. Um, yeah, and I think uh, just on a good example of the above the radar kinds of firms would be the automotive manufacturers in South Africa. Uh, they are often exempted from BE requirements. They typically uh, do, don't uh, have uh, the authority to cede equity to local partners. Their shareholder agreements in Europe or wherever would prohibit them from doing so. So they develop these equity equivalent schemes uh, that uh, are, you know, for example, like a, a road transport fund or something like that uh, to show that they're committed to social upliftment, et cetera. Um, but often, you know, the rules are simply waived for them. And I think that that is a problem on a discretionary level, but I think it also illustrates, you know, how our power works in, in terms of the economic sphere in South Africa. Yeah, I think that's an excellent example. It shows that um, just through the nature and the realities of practical exercise of power, if you're big enough by being a big enough company, or maybe we can discuss this a little bit later, if you're big enough in terms of the networks in which you operate and you can uh, pool your capital and pool your influence. And sometimes you, you can actually um, um, get around uh, the policy intentions of government. And it's not in your, of course, it's in your own interest, but in the end, it's in uh, the society's interest. Okay, so, so far we've spoken about the entrepreneurial level. So this multiplicity of firms and what they can do on a micro level to uh, respond to some of these uh, more adverse policies. But what about at the institutional level that you mentioned earlier? And how can firms begin to coalesce and to kind of build alternative networks or institutions uh, that they can support one another and also create new environments for them to operate? David, there are actually a very interesting historical examples of businesses pooling their uh, capital, pooling their influence and developing alternative networks and um, ways of doing business uh, irrespective of the political arrangements of the day. One of them goes quite a way back. It's the Hanseatic League. It goes back to the uh, late uh, 12th century. And um, uh, then you added it for around 500 years with its uh, apex, let's say, in the uh, late 15, early 1600s. And these, uh, this Hanseatic network or the Hanseatic League uh, in, uh, was perhaps the largest commercial uh, league uh, we've, the world has ever known. Um, it's, today, its memory lives on in Lufthansa uh, and Hansa Pilsner. Uh, but these, this League of Merchants was uh, initially uh, many individual merchants banding together and later an alliance of cities uh, establishing independent trade relations between themselves and negotiating for, uh, for fair, uh, lower taxes and uh, access to ports and uh, in different jurisdictions. At some point, the King of Denmark was not uh, happy with the Hanseatic League and tried to close some of the sea straits around uh, Denmark. And then the Hanseatic League <laughs> got all their merchant ships together, put cannons uh, on, <laughs> on them, and uh, together with some mercenaries, uh, blasted that, um, the, the king into submission and reopened the trade routes. Uh, and, uh, and there are also some other interesting stories we tell, but let me stick with, uh, uh, with this by just saying I raise this example because um, I think what businesses should do today is not entirely novel. In fact, we should just reapply some of the tried and tested principles of institution building. Um, we are used today, yes, to the modern state as we have come to know it in the last century or two, very centralized, um, does not uh, at least uh, on paper, um, allow for negotiation with uh, private entities or private enterprises once a monopoly on power. And that's all good and well on paper. But in practice, um, sovereignty um, uh, is, uh, is um, sovereignty on paper looks good, but in practice, uh, institutions can be built, they can be reformed, and they can operate in parallel. And so this is where I think um, the strategy for businesses working together today should be. It should be to um, firstly reform the institutional environment where possible. Secondly, um, state proof or protect its members against the remaining harmful interventions of that institutional environment. Um, but thirdly, 
providing and building alternative institutions within which and on which to do business, regardless of the level of state failure and the effectiveness of the state institutions. And I can give some examples of each of them, um, if that's okay with you. Please do, Pete, go ahead. So uh, on, the, uh, on the reform side, um, uh, let's say we have the um, expropriation without compensation debate currently in South Africa. Um, what is wonderful to see is a real uptake in the level of engagement and, uh, and uh, uh, lobbying that is being exerted and influence being exerted on government. Businesses uh, working together is, uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, raising their voices together is much more effective than doing so individually. And this is where this distinction comes in. I said earlier that you can individually figure out what to do for your business uh, how to state with yourself, but you can't, it's not a one man band to, uh, to change the environment for doing business. So um, uh, the, the first example I'd like to give of how we can work together to change the institutions for business um, is by um, influencing and reforming government. So we can approach government, we can uh, discuss, uh, we can be forceful, we can be adamant, we can be, uh, we can be friendly, or we can be, uh, we can be hard if it's necessary, to, to change the, the policy environment as developed by government. Um, but then we're, we're very reactionary uh, in this um, and it's okay, but it's a reactionary uh, type of thing to do. What, what becomes more interesting is when we say, okay, we've now attempted to change BE, we've, we've uh, warned against it, we've, uh, we've, we've, uh, but now it's there. Then we, we, we go to the second step of the second level of, of the strategy, which is to start and uh, protect the businesses against that intervention. But it's very hard to protect yourself against BE. You need some um, lightning rods. For example, in this case, Sarkalicha took on some BE cases, and it's much easier for Sarkalicha to be on the radar with regard to BE, explain why it's a failed policy, why it's harmful, uh, do so in a tactful way, um, as, 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 as professionally as possible, but still be forthright that BE is a harmful and failed policy. Um, start the necessary court cases and make sure that we cut off the harmful edges uh, or, or the, 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 um, the, the harmful aspects of BE as much as we can and prevent its expansion and application to new, uh, new areas of business. This is the protection, uh, the protect area. But then this will bring us to the even more exciting, I think, third strategic course of action for businesses working together, and that is developing alternative institutions for doing business, saying that let's imagine for a second that there were, that there were no government, that there were no state, and we, for some reason, there was a collapse of government. We have to find a way of doing business. It's our responsibility. How can we do that? Well, we need to establish ways of, of, of trusting each other. We need to establish ways of connecting with each other. We need, to, uh, we need to do this in a way that does not depend on third parties, but we, we have to provide this ourselves. And this is where alternative dispute resolution comes in. Um, this is where uh, networks and codes of conduct come in, self-regulation. It's a tried and tested concept in the, in the media world. It's a tried and con tested concept all throughout history for different sectors. But, um, uh, but again, I think it becomes more and more relevant as the state becomes either more hostile or less able to provide the institutional environment in which we should operate, then maybe we can provide some of these things ourselves through, through examples such as, um, as this uh, private dispute resolution, codes of conduct, uh, or even uh, what the, what the uh, new uh, digital economy and the digital infrastructure to our, uh, to our um, uh, offers us is uh, networks online, um, putting people directly in business, uh, working together with each other, irrespective of national borders. Now, Pete, Sakulika has been involved in a number of high-profile court cases on some of these issues. So the one that springs to mind was the constitutional court case uh, against the finance minister regarding race-based preferential procurement. Another one would be around energy policy. And uh, perhaps you could uh, explain some of the details of that case, but that was around uh, when a municipality is in arrears with ESCOM, it gets cut off uh, from its uh, kind of main energy distribution uh, uh, pipeline um, that then leaves business owners in the dark in those municipalities. How, how did you go about uh, conducting that case and what was the outcome there? 
Yeah, we have two uh, very exciting and high profile cases going at the moment. The first is this uh, public procurement BEE case where we uh, we're objecting to regulations that make it possible for state owned entities and organs of state to set um, racial requirements uh, as a precondition for tendering. So um, even before your tender is looked at, even before the price or the, the, the proposal is considered, um, the, uh, under the current regulations, the race of the owners are considered. And if it doesn't prescribe, comply with prescriptions, then you're rejected out of hand, as if, uh, as if it was simply a formality, as if you didn't even uh, submit a tender. We find that completely unacceptable. Um, and it misses the mark because it prioritizes the interests of the business people, the shareholders, instead of prioritizing the uh, interests of the public uh, or the recipients of the services. This case uh, was heard in the Constitutional Court. It was a four-year uh, legal uh, adventure. Uh, we are very hopeful uh, that the outcome will be in our favor. We, it would be very surprising uh, to have an unfavorable judgment, uh, but we'll, we'll see about that. And uh, that was recent. The uh, judgment is pending on that one. The other court case that is uh, of quite uh, we're excited about is what we announced uh, three weeks ago, um, and that has uh, is uh, that has to do with local government. South Africa faces a failure at the local government level. Uh, of the 270 municipalities countrywide, um, I think the uh, majority have adverse findings on their record, um, and uh, are, most of them are in financial disarray. Some of them are in a complete state of insolvency. Um, but not only this year, it has been this case for the last 10 years. And as a result of that uh, and local government infighting, we are seeing a complete collapse uh, at the local government level. Towns and rural areas across this country basically becoming uh, impossible to do business in, um, with, given the cost of that. And I mean uh, a total collapse of electricity provision, uh, road networks, um, uh, water, water services, uh, sewage services, etc. So it becomes very hard to do businesses in these areas. And then what happens is the businesses have to leave, they go to the metropolitan areas, the property values in those towns drop to basically zero, and uh, you see an, an, an exodus from those towns and the rural areas into the metropolitan areas, just uh, transferring the pressure to another uh, organ of state, which is also not going to cope with this unnatural change in, uh, in demographics across the country. So we uh, initiated a court case where we uh, we're asking the we're asking the High Court in my king currently, although this could very much end up in the Constitutional Court. We're asking the court to intervene in a very special manner. Now the Constitution provides for different levels of administration and. Uh, ways in which higher levels of government can take over local government once it's failed. But for the past uh, decade, that hasn't happened as it should. And where government and even the Minister of Finance had on numerous occasions been obligated to intervene, that, did, that was not forthcoming. We're asking the court now to firstly order that, um, that higher levels of intervention should happen. But we're saying that because of the state of the municipality, because of the urgency of the matter, uh, the court should appoint a special master um, in line with what is provided for in uh, legislation and in line with what has been uh, done by the constitutional court in other matters, but not at a local government level. We're asking the court to introduce a special master. The special master should firstly take over the uh, collection of the money for service delivery in these towns, electricity and water, collect that in one of the municipality's bank accounts, but do not put that money uh, at the disposal of the local municipality, rather pay that money over to the service providers like ESCOM for electricity and the water boards um, so that they can continue supplying the town with water and electricity. And then secondly, uh, that special master can do emergency infrastructure maintenance to make sure that the water, sewage, electricity uh, keeps going as it should in the town. So then we are taking uh, we, we're, we're circumventing the problem for until such time as the court is satisfied that the national treasury intervention is successful. So we're not asking the, for a mandated national treasury intervention. We're asking the court for a solution uh, until there is success, a successful intervention from the national treasury. And then finally, the special master should also list all instances of wasteful and fruitless expenditure and corrupt, uh, uh, corrupt expenditure. 
uh, pro uh, provide the evidence for that where it's possible and uh, give this to the court, the respondents, and in our case, the applicants, so that we can make sure that there is prosecution. Well, Pete, one of the challenges uh, under this uh, current system that we find ourselves in is that, you know, the judicial system is not immune from some of the kind of policy pressures and dominant ideas. Um, you know, I'm thinking particularly of the Constitutional Court's ruling on the Agri-SA matter, which ultimately transferred mineral rights into the hands of the state, which dramatically affected the mining industry. Mining industry, if you're wanting to sink a new mine shaft, you have to apply to the state for a license. Uh, that now shifts the power dramatically in terms of the, the state's favor. They can impose all sorts of onerous conditions. Uh, so when I mean, you mentioned alternatives, uh, such as alternative dispute resolution, uh, what other ways are there of uh, kind of maybe avoiding some of the uh, more kind of uh, other pernicious problems related to the, ju the justice system itself uh, in terms of its administration? Um, you know, often the courts are not equipped well enough to deal with complex commercial matters as well. Perhaps you could speak to, to, to that challenge. Uh, David, I think that will become more and more common to see uh, mediation and arbitration privately um, in, in terms of a contract rather than a reference to the state legal system. It's already common at an international level and at the level of um, big commercial uh, companies doing business with each other. It's not so common at the smaller business level, um, but we are looking at ways to uh, develop solutions around that, bring the cost of such things down. It's not as easy as it sounds, but um, if I can wager a prediction, uh, then um, I'm sure that we will see a lot more mediation and arbitration, private dispute resolution in the next few years in South Africa. That's really good because it limits the burden on the existing justice system. And so that uh, allows the court probably to focus on, on other matters, uh, which I, I think we can welcome and to, to deal in more detail uh, with matters of constitutional importance rather than commercial disputes. Um, uh, so so I, I think that's a development to welcome. Um, I think, uh, you know, you, you, ref, you refer to the court's uh, rulings in, in the Agri-SA case and um, uh, uh, with regard to mineral rights, but there have also been questionable rulings with regard to water rights, etc. I think we must be realistic that um, this is not unique to South Africa. Any, any legal system, any court system um, in the world is always to some extent operating within the, uh, within the, within the agenda uh, and the, within, at least within the framework of reference of uh, the ruling party of the day, or at least the system um, in place in that country. And so it's understandable and predictable and not unique that the South African court system, the judicial system, will to some extent, um, uh, it, it will be rare for that system to produce judgments entirely in opposition to the um, policy direction of government. Uh, what we, I think the judicial system can deliver is judgments that solve practical problems such as, uh, in this case, the municipal um, level problems where we're not trying to uh, affect uh, a uh, you know, run directly in opposition to a political program. We're simply trying to solve a bread and water issue for everyday uh, citizens and businesses in that town. And I think the courts are uh, amen uh, amenable to, to, this, to, to judgments uh, and um, requests um, on, on that level. Pete, before I let you go, maybe you could tell our viewers and listeners more about the work that Sakhalich is doing and where you see the organization going into the future? David, uh, Sarkanicha is a business organization. We try and do more and more business and less and less politics. Uh, our core mission is to develop a, uh, an, a conducive environment for business in the interests of a flourishing society wherever our members do business. Um, and uh, so we have about 12,000 members. We have several chambers of commerce also affiliated to Sarkalicha. It's a recent program that we started and uh, we expect to have uh, several dozens of chambers, I think in the next three to four years. Um, it's, it's going very well. We're also establishing some direct international trade relations with different countries, trade attaches, as well as uh, different chambers of commerce in different areas of the world. 
Um, and these are all ways in which we try to be institutional entrepreneurs. Uh, we are a business organization and the product and service we deliver, our core business is of an institutional nature. And uh, we, we, I think we're good at that. We have a great team, we have great support. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization and uh, some wonderful people are enabling us to do this. Um, and uh, I'm really proud to be associated with this uh, organization. Um, we, we are an independent business community, David, and we internalize the locus of control and uh, where it's necessary, we confront. Uh, where it's necessary, we protect the business, uh, our businesses and our members. And where it's necessary, we provide alternatives. Well, Peter, I'm very glad that we had this conversation because in many ways, the work of Sarkalicha echoes the theme of this podcast, which is to try and find bottom-up solutions to some of South Africa's more intractable problems and to help people navigate through what is an uncertain and often difficult environment, but to, to be, as you say, uh, on the front foot, to have that internal locus of control and uh, to, to create alternative spaces uh, for them to uh, create prosperity for themselves and their families, but also uh, you know, to come up with new innovative ideas uh, for, for how to solve uh, some of these, these bigger problems. So I wanted to thank you very much for joining me on Solutions with David Ansara, and we wish you well with your work. Thank you, David. It was an enjoyable conversation. If you enjoyed this content, please do like this video and subscribe to the channel if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening on your favorite podcast platform, please do rate this podcast and also share it amongst your networks. It really helps the show to grow. My name is David Ansara. Thank you for joining me on the podcast. And until next time, take care.